Hello, my name is Roy Simpson. I'm a professor of mathematics at Cosumnes River College in Sacramento, California. This lecture video is a continuation of learning linears via models. Uh, this is just the part B of it, and we're actually just going to continue on into some more modeling processes and also talking about um, the structure of a linear equation a little bit more. Not too much more, but a little bit more. We'll just need to recall a little bit from last lecture that a linear equation in two variables is an equation of the form ax plus by is equal to c, where a, b, and c are all constants, uh, and a and b are both not zero, or not both zero actually at the same time. One of them could be zero, but the other one cannot. Also we'll be using the fact that the graph of any linear equation is going to be a line. So that and that's uh, as I mentioned in the last lecture, a fact or a way to remember that is that you have ax plus by is equal to c. There's a lot of different formats for this, but it's linear because the powers on the variables here, x and y, are actually one. Nobody really writes them in, but they really are one, and uh, that forces the, this to be a linear equation and also to graph as a line. So we'll start off with a simple example of just graphing a certain linear equation by plotting points. And there are, just kind of as a side note, there are several ways to plot a linear equation or to graph a linear equation. It means the same thing. Uh, and one is to build a table and plot points. That's what we're going to do here. Another is to just find what are called the intercepts and use those to, to graph. And that's actually a very easy method. I like that method a lot. Another one is to put in a very special form called slope-intercept form, and then finally the last method is to use the point-slope form. And of course, uh, not of course actually, but there are other methods. You could use just the slope, somebody hands you a slope and gives you the intercept, you could use that as well. We'll talk about each of those in uh, future lectures, but for now we're just going to go ahead and build a table of values. When you build a table of values, you select a variable that you think represents what should be the input variable and a variable you think should be the output variable. In this case it really doesn't matter which variable you select as input and which variable you select as output. Commonly we select x to be the input variable and y to be the output variable, but that's not necessary. Okay? You, you actually learn which way is best by just trying values or I'm sorry, by uh, learning mathematics, you kind of get a little more experience and, and you're able to see it kind of obviously. Now, I'm not going to go about this the wisest of ways. I'm just going to plug in a few x values like x equals a negative 2, negative 1, 0, and then 1, and then 2. Okay, And for each of these values of x that I'm plugging in, I'll plug those into the original equation and find out what the resulting value of y should be. Well, in this case, you see you have negative 6 plus y, so I'll add 6 to both sides, so I get y is equal to 5. So this tells me that when x is a negative 2, y is equal to 5. And now I'm going to plug in a negative 1 for x. And this is negative 3 right here, so I'll add 3 to both sides. I'll get y is equal to 2. So when x is negative 1, y is 2. Then I'll plug in x equals 0. There's something to learn from plugging in x equals 0. The thing that we're going to learn here is that it essentially makes this entire term disappear. So you just have y is equal to a negative one. It's a very easy uh, point to plug in. Usually x equals zero is extremely nice to plug in. Also, if you're going to plug in for values for y, uh, then y equals zero is a really good one to plug in as well. And actually, since I'm talking about it, I'm going to go ahead and highlight the stuff that I'm plugging in so you know what I chose to plug in. Because some people might get confused and say, wait, did you plug in five for y and get out negative two for x? Um, it would have, if we did plug in 5 for i for y, we would have gotten negative 2 for x, but that's not how I, I approach that. 
All right, so let's go ahead and plug in 1 for x. So let's see, the left-hand side of the equation is 3 plus y, so I'll subtract 3 from both sides to get y is equal to a negative 4. And finally, plugging in 2. Well, let's see, 3 times 2 is 6, so subtracting 6 from both sides, I get a negative 7. I want you to notice a few things here before I continue. Notice that for each step of 1 in the x direction, so I start at x equals negative 2, I step forward by 1 to x equals negative 1, and then I'll step forward again to x equals 0, I'll step forward again to x equals 1, forward again to x equals 2. For each of those steps of 1, notice the y value decreases by a common number. It dropped by 3, it drops by a number 3, drops by another 3, and then drops by another 3. That is a common property of linear equations that when you take single steps uh, you always drop by the same number for a specific equation. It's not always going to be 3, it might be uh, 2, uh, it might be 1, it might be 2.8, something like that. But linear equations have this wonderful property that every time you take a single step you will always drop by the same number. Well anyway, regardless, and we'll talk about that later, let's go ahead and plot these points. So I brought up a little bit of graph paper here and this will allow us to go ahead and plot these points. Let me get a thicker brush here. All right, so I'm gonna plot negative two comma positive five. So that's right about here. And then I'll plot negative one, positive two. Then I'll plot zero comma negative one. Then I'll plot one comma negative four. And finally, two comma negative seven. And if you look at this, if I draw a line, which is sort of difficult with me doing this freehand, but if I draw a line, or I'm sorry, a curve, connecting those points, it turns out that it'll be a line. So there we go. That's that's how you graph by plotting points. You just build a table, plot the points, and you're, you're pretty much done. But this brings into play a couple piece of information I want to talk about. Um, so we've talked about in a previous uh, video the fact that this is called the Cartesian coordinate system. We've talked about linear equations in this video and how to graph linear equations by plotting points. But there are other things we need to describe. The fact that this curve or this line is decreasing from left to right. It's falling down from left to right. We call this a decreasing curve. So let me write that down. So here's a definition for decreasing and increasing curves. We say a curve or a line, a line is a type of curve, uh, we say a curve is decreasing if when we read it from left to right the curve falls. We say it's increasing if when reading from left to right the curve rises. And a curve does not necessarily have to always be one or the other. So let's take a, a simple example. Let's suppose that we have a point one x equals 2, x equals 3. I'm not going to draw a line at this point. I'm just going to draw some type of curve. And let's pretend that it does this. And then it's flatlining from this point forward. Okay. It turns out that in the region where, well, I'll just point at it. In this region right here, the curve is increasing. In other words, if I read from left to right, like I read a book, this curve is growing, 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 all the way up until you get to this point at x equals 1. From that point to x equals 2, it's decreasing, right? It's falling as I read that from left to right. Now, here it's neither. It's neither increasing nor decreasing. So there is, there is a possibility that you can have a section of your graph where it's not increasing nor is it decreasing. The last definition we're going to get into before we do some modeling examples again is uh, the intercepts of a curve. And this is kind of a big thing because interpretation of intercepts is huge. Uh, the intercepts of a curve are basically where the curve itself crosses an axis. axis. 
Specifically, we have two major axes that we talk about, at least in this course. We have a horizontal axis and we have a vertical axis. We often call this the x-axis and the y-axis, right? And where your curve intersects these axes, that's called the intercept. So this is an intercept and uh, this is an intercept and so on and so forth. I'll just highlight each of the intercepts here. Now <clears throat> the ones that cross the x-axis are called x-intercepts and the ones that cross the y-axis are called the y-intercepts. Generally uh, curves that you're going to deal with in mathematics, you generally only have one y-intercept. Now, there are some special curves that ha do have more than one, but we're really interested in the curves that have only one y-intercept. On the other hand, the x-intercepts, uh, you can have a lot of those. We're going to use all of this technology, all these definitions and theorems to help us with uh, examples in, in an intermediate algebra class and future courses as well. So this is not something that you can just kind of pass by and think, well, I don't need to know it. Uh, I, I can just get through this section in my course and never see this again. You'll see these topics throughout all of mathematics. Now this is a, an example I actually ran into recently. I called up uh, Citibank um, and talked to them about their fee structures, how they determine uh, what your minimum payment is and then I also talked to them about what happens when you make your minimum payment where does that go it doesn't go where you think it goes so it, that's a very interesting side topic but for now let's deal with a real situation what they do with your money or how they determine uh, your minimum payment so let me read this city cards determines your minimum payment using a somewhat simple formula the first part that makes up the minimum payment is the interest accrued on your outstanding balance. So you have some balance and uh, your minimum payment has uh, the interest uh, from your outstanding balance put into it. To this they add any fees that you incur, incurred during the period. This, these are things like late fees or um, uh, other fees. I, I, you know, it might be um, over drawn fees, whatever it may be. And finally, the remainder of the minimum payment is either 1% of your balance, if you always carry a balance, or 1.5% of your balance, if you always pay off your balance. Very, very cool kind of situation. So in other words, if you always pay off your balance, then and I don't, uh, then you will have a higher minimum payment. Just I the way they have it set up. Okay. So let's go ahead and do some uh, mathematics with this. Um, the first thing we're going to assume is that we carry a balance in the credit card. Okay, so this is we're going to say that we always carry a balance. So in other words, in this situation, I'm assuming that uh, we have that that we're doing the one percent that that our uh, minimum payment includes one percent of our balance. How much would your minimum payment be if the interest accrued last bill was $15.93, you have no fees, and your current balance is $7,833.01? And a little note here, they always round down. That was one of the conversations with an account rep there, was that they once they do the mathematics, they always round down their calculations. And uh, if, if you know a little bit about math, you know that that means that they, in the long run, get more money from you. Of course, that's how it's meant. So let's go ahead and write down the things that we know. So as I said, the minimum payment is equal to the interest plus the fees plus 1% of the balance in this situation because uh, this is the situation where we're saying that we always carry a balance. So we're paying 1% of the balance. That's what makes up the minimum payment. And as it said in the previous part, um, let's see, our interest on last bill is $15.93. So I'll just put that in here. And then we had no fees, so 1593 plus no fees plus 1% of the balance. So that's, remember to write a percent as a decimal, 0 0.01. And our balance from last bill, assuming like an average daily, daily balance, 783301. 
3301. So that should be our minimum payment. So let's go ahead and figure out the minimum payment here. No shame in opening up the calculator. Um, one thing I will say that I mentioned already, they told me that they always round this part down. When it's 1% of your uh, of your average daily balance there, that means that $78.33 is spent on uh, of, from your balance basically that's that portion is from your balance but they actually round it to $78 I'm not gonna do it here I'm gonna keep it um, at, to near, rounded to the nearest penny but just to let you know if you really want a realistic situation they call that $78 and they let that 33 cents ride um, so anyway then to that I'm gonna add 1593 I get 9426 rounded to the nearest penny that's what it will be so 9426 that's a pretty decent minimum payment so I just went ahead and wrote that in there that's our minimum payment now so suppose the situation is exactly the same as what we just said but your balance is instead B we don't know the balance Okay, so it's the end of the month and you have no idea what your balance is, but you know you haven't incurred any fees and you know your interest last month was $15.93. Let's write an equation for your minimum payment in terms of your balance B. Now what I'll do here is I'll just look at what we did before. Remember the minimum payment, let's just call that M, or maybe did I say that we were going to use P here? Let me double check we are using P for the minimum payment so let me erase that and call that P and that's equal to the interest which we're still assuming is fifteen dollars and ninety three cents plus the fees which we're still assuming is zero plus one percent of the balance and we don't know the balance so this looks to me when we clean it up a little bit fifteen ninety three plus 0.01b that looks like a linear equation to me all the variables have a single unit power on them there are two variables a p and a b uh, that is a linear equation and in fact if you remember from last lecture I called this chunk the initial value and I called this the incremental value and very important to know that this means that initially our payment is fifteen dollars ninety three cents but then we increase it by a penny for every dollar we increase the balance that's a good way to think about it so let me go ahead and write this as my answer for the last part there uh, and I'll put it right here P is equal to fifteen ninety three plus 0.01b I have to fit it in there I don't know if that got cut off on your screen it might have now use your equation to determine your minimum payment given several different ba balances ah this is just me telling myself to, to do some experiments so let's do some experiments suppose um, well let's put in a little see here suppose your balance is um, 12,138.40 so if my balance is that, then I know my minimum payment is just going to be fifteen ninety three. That's the interest from last month, plus one percent of that twelve thousand one thirty eight forty. Suppose we only need to do one example. So if you do this, it's going to be fifteen ninety three plus one twenty one thirty eight, and we'll go ahead and add these two together. We get $137.31. Of course, you could do this with any balance and also with any interest, right? If, if you got charged a different amount of interest, interest last month, you, you'd change that value as well. So uh, that's an example of kind of evaluating this equation at different values. Now let's reverse the situation. Let's suppose our minimum payment is $325 how can we determine our current balance assuming that everything else is the same in other words we had the fifteen dollars and ninety three cents in interest and we haven't had any fees so again we're gonna suppose that our minimum payment is 325 
looking at this formula right here, I'll highlight. That means that I'm assuming that P is $325. And if I know the interest that they charged me last month was $15.93, I just don't know my balance. Well, that's pretty easy to find now. You see, that's a linear equation with just one variable. We'll just subtract $15.93 from both sides and divide both sides by 0 0.01. So let's see, 325 uh, minus 1593. And then we're going to go ahead and divide that by 0 0.01. 30,907 dollars. Wow, that's pretty crazy. That's a pretty intense balance, actually. Um, but that's what I have. So that's that's what you can expect if your interest was this last month. But that basically means that um, you would have you would have a very low balance the prior month, and you would have racked up a ton of debt in a single month. That's why it's so large. Generally, if you have a payment like this, your interest from the previous month would be more like, you know, let's say 80, 90, 100, 120 bucks or something like that. So still it's a very large balance. Now here's a more of a conceptual question. I, I kind of dig these questions. If you're one of my students, then you should be very aware that I ask questions like these often. Uh, if your balance goes up by a hundred bucks, how much does your minimum payment go up by? That's a pretty good conceptual question. So let's go ahead and uh, again take a look at this formula. If our balance goes up by a hundred dollars, well how much does our minimum payment go up by? Well, suppose that we start with a balance of zero. So in other words that our payment with a balance uh, of zero, so let me make a little table here. If my balance was zero my payment would be my initial value, right? Because if you let B equal zero, this disappears. My payment's just fifteen dollars and ninety-three cents. It's just my interest. If my balance increases by a hundred dollars, well then it's fifteen ninety-three plus point oh one times one hundred. But point oh one times a hundred, that's like saying what's one one hundredth of a hundred? These two cancel, it just becomes the number one. So it's essentially saying that it's it, you're adding a dollar. So this becomes sixteen dollars and ninety three cents, and that should make sense. For every hundred dollars you you accrue in uh, balance, a dollar is going to be added to your minimum payment. So uh, this is that's essentially what that's saying is if you increase it by a hundred dollars, well one one hundredth of that is tacked onto your minimum payment. So one dollar. By the way, if you never carry a balance, in other words, you always pay off, so you're in this situation right here, then for every hundred dollars that your balance goes up by, then your minimum payment goes up by a dollar fifty. Alright, now we're asked to graph this equation. We're getting into the more mathy stuff here. So let me go ahead and hop down a couple pages so I can get to a nice pretty graph. So here we are, I have a set of axes here. Um, our input variable will be our B. In other words, that's what we're going to increase. We're going to increase our balance and then we're going to see what happens to our minimum payment. So the thing that depends upon that is the payment. What we can adjust is the balance. So let's go ahead and do that. You can make a table here if you want. I already kind of wrote one down earlier, but I'll rewrite a little bit of it. And the balance is zero. We just pay fifteen ninety three, and let's say the balance is a hundred. Then it's sixteen ninety three. Okay. Choose proper scales for your axes. So here's the balance of zero here. I'll say this is a balance of one hundred here. So we have a balance of two hundred and so on and so forth. Although we're not really worried about two hundred, and let's pretend that amount right here is at uh, 1593. So that's 0, 
then when we have a balance of 100, according to my table here, the payment should be 1693. And of course I could have done it if the balance was 500 or something like that. Let's go ahead and connect these two points and you'll see we have an increasing line but it's just barely steadily increasing. Whoops, didn't mean to do that there. But anyway, freehanding my drawing. So this is an increasing line. Obviously reading from left to right, you could see the line is steadily increasing. So that's a good descriptor, by the way. If you see a picture of a graph of an equation, you see it's increasing, you can, it gives you a general idea of, of if you increase the balance, then your payment increases. That makes sense. The fact that it's not increasing very quickly means that if you make a huge jump in your balance, your actual minimum payment doesn't jump that much. Okay. Um, a couple other things I want to note here. A recent addition to our language was the idea of an intercept. This would be the vertical intercept, correct? Vertical, sometimes we call it the Y intercept, um, because this is the letter for this axis or the variable we're using is not y. I would call that the p intercept. So if you're going to use a letter, I would use p because it's the p axis, the p intercept. But often I don't I don't even say letters. I say the vertical intercept. And the meaning behind the vertical intercept here is the following. So meaning of vertical intercept, and this is hugely important. If you want to be good in mathematics, you have to understand things, not just memorize them. So the meaning of the vertical intercept is basically uh, the payment when balance is zero. And that's we still have a payment because the fact is we have interest that accrued from last month. So <clears throat> very interesting. Uh, way to, to think about that. Now there is a meaning also to the horizontal intercept, but it's very difficult with this problem to interpret the meaning of the horizontal intercept, so I'm not going to do it with this problem. Now let me hop back a couple pages here. Let's see, we graphed the equation and uh, we stated what the meaning of the intercept was. Now one last little problem, suppose you never carry a balance, okay, so you always pay in full. Now, if that's the case, we're in the second situation. I'll highlight it. We're in this situation right here, where we get, we always have to pay one and a half percent of our balance. And, <clears throat> however, last month you had a um, thirty-one dollars and twenty cents in interest, and but <laughs> that's poor language, and you had a late fee of twenty-five dollars. How much was your balance if your minimum payment was two hundred and eighty dollars? Okay, a lot of different numbers here. <clears throat> a completely different situation. So let's go ahead. I'm going to write the uh, the equation up above here. So I know the minimum payment is equal to the interest, which we have here is 31.20, plus any fees, which we have here is $25, plus a certain percentage of our balance. And the cer certain percentage, if we're always paying off our balance, the certain percentage that we're going to have to pay for a minimum payment is one and a half. Remember, one and a half written as a decimal is 0 0.015 of our balance. So this is the formula or the equation. In fact, I can add 25 to 31. That's what is that, 56.20? So in, in reality, this is just 56.20 uh, plus 0.015b. And the question is, how much was your balance if your minimum payment was 280? In other words, here our payment is going to be 280. We just don't know the balance. So it becomes a very familiar problem. So I've rewritten it here. This is our payment. We know that's the payment. We're just trying to find the balance. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and subtract, clear all this stuff out, take 280, subtract off 5620, find out what that is, and I'll divide that by 0.015. And I see my balance here 
is 14,920. Not too bad. And this is just using all the technology that we have uh, created so far in this course. So let me write this in here, 14,920. All the technology we created, at least in this lecture today. The last little bit here is just going to concern ourselves with some really basic mathematics, some behind the scenes mathematics uh, that <clears throat> you need to do any problem in a um, in a regular intermediate algebra course. Now, the way we've approached this, though, remember, we've approached this from a very uh, modeling standpoint. And the reason why is because I think it's easier to understand the meaning of all this stuff using a model first, and then going in and doing the silly math behind the scene. So each of these, we're just going to find the intercepts and then graph the equation using the intercepts. The first one here, we have, uh, let's see, 3x over 7 plus 4y over 5 is equal to 3. Now, the first thing I'm going to tell you right now is when I see an equation that has fractions in it, I immediately know, listen, I can get rid of fractions. Equations allow me to get rid of fractions because the fact is that you can multiply both sides of an equation by any number you want besides 0. So if I want to multiply both sides of this by pi or by 10 or by 35, whatever number I want, I could do that. So I'm going to choose the number that I multiply both sides by um, wisely by finding the LCD. And the LCD for all fractions in this equation is just going to be 35. That's a prerequisite skill. You should be able to do that no matter what. So I'll go ahead and multiply both sides of this equation by 35. Think of, of an equation as a teeter-totter. If you multiply the weight on one side by 35, then to keep the teeter-totter teeter even, you have to multiply the weight on the other side by 55. If you don't know what a teeter-totter is, Google it. All right. uh, distributing this 35 to each of these terms here, 7 goes into 35 five times, so I'll get 5 uh, um, I, you know what, I might as well just do it slowly, but I'm not going to do it slowly forever, just, just maybe for this last example here. Uh, so I distribute that 35 to each of these terms. On the right-hand side, what is that, 90 plus 15 is 105? Okay. And I see here, oh, 7 goes into 35 five times. 5 goes into 35 7 times, and this is the beauty of multiplying both sides by the LCD, is because when you do that, you get 5 times 3x, or in other words 15x, plus 7 times 4y, which is 28y, is equal to 105, and all of a sudden, no more fractions. So remember, with equations you can do this. You cannot do this, this uh, with expressions. You must have an equal sign in the original problem to be able to do something like this. All right, so let's find the intercepts. Now, something I didn't really mention about the intercepts, but it's pretty obvious when you look at them. If I have a line that looks like this, so here's the x-axis and here's the y-axis. These intercepts, think about this point right here. It's got an x value and a y value. The x value for this point is going to be, it has to be zero. It just has to be zero because that's the x value for anything along this vertical line. The y value is some number, who cares? Along the same lines here, this point back here, the y value, in other words, its height for this point, is zero. The x value is some number, who cares? But the y value is zero. That's very important. So now look at that. I don't want you to memorize this. I want you to just know that if you ever forget, you can just draw a picture like this really quickly and go, listen, there's something about this point. What can I say? Is there something simple I can say about this point? Oh yeah, the x value is zero. In other words, if you want to find the y-intercept, let x be zero. If you want to find the x-intercept, well, the y-value has to be zero. Okay. But I still, rather than memorizing that, I just do this business. 
what happens if x is 0 here? Well, if x is 0, let me just make this disappear, you have 28y is equal to 105. And when you divide both sides by uh, 28, you get that y is 105 over 28. And I don't know, I don't think that that, that, that reduces. Actually, it does reduce. I think 7 goes into both of those. Yeah, 7 goes into 105 15 times. And 7 goes into 28 4 times. 73. Yep, that's right. Okay. So I see that one of my intercepts is at 0, 15 fourths. The other intercept, I just let y equal 0 this time. And remember, this was actually 15x here. If I let y equal 0, well, then this disappears. I don't know why it's not, but there we go. That disappears. And that allows me to divide both sides of this equation now by 15. So I get 105 over 15. And that actually reduces because both those numbers, actually 15 goes nicely into 105 seven times. All right. That's pretty cool. So we found two points. Uh, one is at 0, 15 fourths. The other is at 7, 0. And now to graph this, I just go ahead and uh, maybe bring up a piece of graph paper. So to plot 0, 15 fourths, let's see, 4 goes into 15 three times with some spare change on it. Uh, so let's see, that's, oh, I think I'm, uh, I don't have the pen on. There we go. One, two, three with some spare change. Right about there. That's probably 0, 15 fourths. And uh, 7, 0. So go over 7 in the x direction and nowhere in the y direction. And you can see that this method of graphing is actually much more, uh, or much faster, I think. In my opinion, I think it's very fast to graph using the intercepts. And they call this the intercept method for graphing, by the way. Um, sorry that I can't draw a line straight. I, I can't watch what I'm writing when I write. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and do example B. We have an equation like this. Now, in this case, I don't see any fractions. Uh, but I do notice a few other things here, but but that's okay. I, I think what I'll do is I'll move everything to one side, all the variables, variable terms to one side. So I'll add 20y to both sides. This is the easiest form to work with when you're getting, uh, when you're trying to graph the intercepts. If you get your equation into a form where all those, the terms with variables are on the left-hand side and everything without variables in other words, your constant terms, are on the other side, uh, then uh, it's extremely easy because then you ask yourself, okay, well, suppose that x is 0. Well, if x is 0, again, let's make that disappear, we have 20y is equal to 1,200. If you divide both sides by 20, you will get y is equal to, uh, what is that, 60? Oops, I don't need the y is equal to, I'll just write 60 there. And now, if we let y equal 0, we have, and I accidentally erased one of the equal signs, we have that 40x is equal to 1200, and so if I divide both sides by 40, I'll get x is equal to 30. Again, the original equation was just this. I'm just erasing that for visuals. And you see how quickly it, how quick it is to, to find the intercepts. Let's go ahead and graph this equation. Okay, so I kind of cheated. I only have a 5 by 5 or a grid piece of paper that's 10 by 10. So I'm just pretending those as though it, these are 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, that type of thing. So 0, 60, uh, when x is 0, y is 60, we're up here. And at 30, 0, 10, 20, 30, 0, we're down here. Connect the dots, and you have your line. 
And again, this line is a visualization of all the solutions to this equation. So when x is 20, uh, the corresponding y value will land us back onto this line. Okay. Now example C, the very last example, is 3.2y minus 1.6x is equal to 64. Often when I see something like this, if I have decimals, just like if I have fractions, if I had fractions, I'd like to multiply both sides by something to get rid of fractions. If I have decimals, I would like to multiply both sides by a number so that I can get rid of the decimals. And 10 is a good choice because that will move each of these decimal places over by one. So I'll get 32y minus 16x is equal to 640. While it's not necessary to do this, it is nice to do this. All my variable terms are already together on the left-hand side. All my constant terms are already together on the right-hand side. So I'll just make a table of values here. When x is 0, or in other words, when this junk is gone here, and let me... I have 32y is equal to 640. Dividing both sides by 32, I get y is equal to 20. Now, if instead I were to let y equal 0, let's see if I can erase this properly this time. Remember, don't erase that negative. That negative is there on purpose. Okay. So when y is 0, I get that x is equal to 640 over a negative 16, and that is going to be, I think, a negative 40. Yeah, I'm fairly certain about that. And so, I'll just graph this freehand here. When x is 0, y is 10, 20. And when y is 0, x is 10, 20, 30, and negative 40. Here's an increasing graph. Whoops, I missed my intercept there. And there you have it. Easiest way to graph a linear equation really, truly, is by using the intercept method. If your equation is already written in a very nice form, the form where it's uh, where all your variable terms are on one side, um, it also helps that these numbers go nicely into the right-hand side numbers. Now I do have one last final example and then, then I'm done with this. Um, this one I like because it just a little extra oomph onto all the stuff we've done. The owner of a gas station has $4,800 to spend on unleaded gas this month. Regular unleaded costs him $0.60 cents per gallon. Premium costs $0.80 cents per gallon. How much does X gallons of regular unleaded cost? Well, regular unleaded costs him 60 cents per gallon. If he buys X gallons, if he buys one gallon of it, it costs him 60 cents, right? If he buys two gallons of it, it costs him $1.20, or in other words, two times 60 cents. If he buys three gallons of it, it costs him three times 60 cents. If he bought X gallons of it, it costs him X times 60 cents. So the amount that it will cost him to buy x gallons of regular unleaded is 0.6x or 0.60x, whichever you prefer. Now we're going to write an equation that relates the amount of regular unleaded gasoline, x, the owner can buy and the amount of premium unleaded that the owner can buy. Well, this is, uh, this is how much regular unleaded costs. So, price for uh, regular unleaded. Okay. The price for the premium unleaded, obviously, therefore, is going to be 0.8x. Actually, y, since he's buying y of those. So, let me erase that because it looks really bad. He's buying y gallons of that. If he only bought one gallon, it would cost 80 cents. Two gallons would cost two times 80. Five gallons would cost five times 80 cents. <coughs> Excuse me, y gallons is y times 80 cents. So this is the amount he spends for premium unleaded. 
This is the amount he spends for regular unleaded. Altogether, the amount he spends altogether is 0.6x plus 0.8y. That's how much he spent for fuel altogether. And he's spending 4800 So the sum of what he spends on un regular unleaded and premium unleaded has to be 4800 The second, or the part C of this, is asking for us to find the intercepts. Well, again, I would probably write this as 60x plus, not 60x, 6x plus 8y is equal to 48,000. And then find the intercepts. Well, when x is 0, that's gone. I just ask myself, how many times does 8 go into 48,000? It goes in 6,000 times. And when y is 0, this disappears. The second term disappears. And so it's just asking me how many times does 6x, or in other words, how many times does 6 go into 48,000? And that goes in 8,000 times. So there are the intercepts. I'll just write them down 0, 6,000, and 8,000, 0. Now sketch the graph. Zero comma six thousand one two three four five six thousand and eight thousand comma zero one two three four five six seven eight and I'll connect those. Probably a good idea to label your axes. This is the x axis, this is the y axis. Remember, X stands for the amount of regular unleaded. Y stands for the amount of premium unleaded. And what I get is a graph of all the possibilities of combinations of regular unleaded and premium unleaded gasoline that I can purchase with $4,800. Every point on that line represents a combination of premium and regular unleaded. The last part is, what do the intercepts tell us about the amount of gasoline? Well, the y-intercept tells us that if we don't buy any regular, we can buy 6,000 gallons of premium. So I'll write that down. The x-intercept tells us that if x is 8,000, in other words, if we have 8,000 gallons of regular, and then we can't get any premium. Or in other words, no premium implies we have 8,000 gallons of regular. Okay, that's a very fast problem, but still kind of gets the idea across one final time.